now, and it's a bit sad, final day of the main conference, which has been a great, great success for us. Um, your support and, and your active participation made the Research 2012 uh, record-breaking conference. We expect we exceeded the number of submissions um, of papers that we received by about 22 percent from last year, uh, and the total number of people ever registered um, for this conference was higher than last year again. So we keep topping it up. So it's going to be hard for next year when we have it in Brisbane. Um, obviously, the quality of the program has been outstanding, and that's thanks to you to our speakers. Without yours and the sponsors and exhibitor support, this conference wouldn't be possible. So thank you very much for, for supporting us. Um, and many of you since the beginning of the conference um, six years ago. Um, you are in for a treat this morning, as you have been in the previous days as well. And today we have two remarkable featured speakers. And I am very, very honored to introduce Professor Shaw, which will take us to groundbreaking artworks that herald the digitally expanded cinema of tomorrow. Uh, Professor Shaw uh, is internationally recognized as a leading figure in new media art since 1960 in a prolific uh, oeuvre of widely exhibited and critically acclaimed works, he has pioneered and set benchmarks for the creative use of creative media in the fields of virtual and augmented reality, immersed visualization environments, navigable um, cinematic um, systems, and interactive narrative. Shaw was the founding director of the ZKM Institute for Visual Media, Karls Rusk. Yeah, um, from 1991 to 2002, and in 2003, he was awarded the, an Australian Research Council Federation Fellowship to co-found and direct the U, uh, U University of um, South Wales iCinema Centre for Interactive Cinema Research. Since 2009, Shaw is, is Chair Professor of Media Art and Dean of the School of Creative Arts at City University of, in Hong Kong as well as Director of the Applied Laboratory for inter inter Interactive Visualization and Embodiment, uh, ALIVE, and the Center for Applied Computing and Interactive Media. Um, if you could please um, welcome me to bring to the podium uh, Professor Shaw. Thank you, Viviani. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, my appreciation to the uh, organizers of this conference to give me the uh, opportunity to, uh, to present here today uh, in the uh, Grand Lodge in, uh, in Sydney. So as, uh, as Viviani uh, indicated, uh, my uh, research practice over the last 20 or so years has been spread over a number of institutions. Currently uh, at uh, the um, Applied Laboratory for Interactive Visualization and Embodiment in Hong Kong. Uh, before that, uh, at the ZKM Institute for Visual Media in Karlsruhe in Germany. Um, at the uh, iCinema Research Center at uh, UNSW, which I, I co-founded, and uh, also um, research uh, done by me and my, and asso and my associates at uh, Museum Victoria in, uh, in Melbourne. So the title of my presentation is Future Cinema, but in the context of this uh, conference, it could just as well uh, be titled uh, Embodying big data. Um, and certain themes uh, will be addressed in this presentation, um, which uh, I think are fairly fundamental to uh, these notions of uh, future cinema and uh, embodying big, big data. One, of course, is interactivity. 
And uh, throughout this presentation, I'll be showing uh, examples of, uh, of mostly of work of my own, but also work of, uh, uh, of my associates um, that uh, sort of uh, explicates these uh, various themes. So this is uh, The Legible City, uh, a work made in um, 1989. It allows a bicyclist to bicycle in a virtual, um, um, let's say, urban environment where the buildings are replaced by letters and the letters form words, the words form texts and sentences. So basically you're bicycling through an urban landscape uh, and at the same time reading, reading the city, reading the buildings. Um, and we use ground plans of actual cities of um, Manhattan, of Amsterdam and of uh, Karlsruhe. And um, so, um, you, you actually bicycle through those uh, actual ground plans and uh, encounter um, these, um, this, the, the, the text. So it becomes, a, a, of course, a literary experience, the, uh, the journey through these, um, through these virtual uh, urban environments. So in the case of the uh, version we made uh, based on the ground plan of uh, Amsterdam, and you see the ground plan on a small uh, LCD screen in front of the bicycle, and you actually see your location on that ground plan, um, here you see the letter sizes vary because each letter actually expresses the, um, the height and the width and the depth of, an, of the actual building which it replaces and um, no buildings were invented and no buildings were left out. So if you uh, live, live in Amsterdam, you could actually bicycle to the letter where you, uh, where you are living. This work is called uh, The Web of Life and uh, here the uh, interface is uh, the lines on uh, a person's hand. You actually put your hand on a scanner. It, uh, it reads the, the main lines on your hand and uses that pattern and puts that pattern uh, on the screen. And you can see that the new pattern links then to patterns, to earlier patterns of other people's hands. So you actually connect the pattern of your hand lines to other people's hand lines who have used this work before. And, uh, in, and behind this, let's say, web of, uh, of, uh, of hand lines, there, there is a sort of tapestry of, uh, a sort of cellular tapestry of video clips which express different kinds of networks, uh, sort of uh, electronic networks, biological networks, uh, uh, urban networks, social networks. Another thematic is immersion. Uh, this is a very early work of mine, going right back to the 60s, but it, it shows one uh, important experiment for me where um, it was at a f film festival and instead of the screen being on the wall and people seated and their seats were in here, the actual screen surface was on the floor. It was a big sort of inflatable um, um, structure and films were projected on it and the audience was invited to jump into the screen and uh, actually be physically co-present with the projected images. So um, you could either be in the image or watch other people sort of uh, jumping around in the screen. Now a more recent configuration of this, um, let's say, um, strategy of embodiment is this work done in a cave environment, a cave has 3D projection on a number of walls and on the floor and so that uh, as a viewer you really have a sense of total immersion in uh, a virtual space which stretches to infinity in all directions around you and below you. And in this particular work, uh, the user interface that was developed was a uh, wooden mannequin which has uh, uh, sensors in all its joints. Um, so that um, as you manipulate the puppet, um, you um, modulate uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, both the visuals and the, the acoustic space. Mm -hmm. 
So it's the handling of this uh, sort of surrogate body that actually uh, modulates the, uh, the, the audio-visual experience. And certain, you can see, for instance, in this, uh, in this particular moment, that because the puppet has been put upside down, it triggers a specific event uh, that's related to this position of, of, the, uh, of the mannequin. And um, another behavior is that if you close the puppet's eyes, uh, the room will go dark, and when you open the puppet's eyes, you will enter a, a different, uh, let's say, visual space, a different, um, you'll have a different experience. Another thematic is the, uh, the, the, the panoramic gaze, the notion of panorama. Uh, this has been around for a long time, of course, because uh, there's a big history, for instance, of panoramic painting. And uh, in the cinema, of course, uh, the desire to sort of stretch the screen and uh, create a more, a more and more immersive experience has been very, uh, very um, sort of fundamental to its, uh, its development. Um, these are certain, let's say, research experiments and, and artworks that were developed around the notion of uh, panorama. Here, for instance, um, you have a, a, a circular screen, and uh, this platform is uh, motorized. The projectors are actually mounted on the platform so that this image can be rotated all the way around this screen so that uh, basically you have a window that is a window into a uh, panoramic um, virtual environment. Um, a lot of the work I'll be showing you uh, is linked to, to, uh, um, certain, to a cultural heritage um, topics. This, for instance, is a work done at uh, Hampi, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site in, uh, in India. And um, here you can see the camera we were using uh, to capture um, 3D uh, panoramic uh, images. This, it's uh, basically two cameras, two film cameras side by side. Uh, one, let's say, for the left eye image, the other for the right eye image, able to capture a pair of panoramas, which then constitute uh, a 3D um, panorama. And these... Um, Let's say these stereo panoramic uh, images are then distributed in a virtual world as a, um, as a, uh, as a sort of landscape of uh, cylinders. And one can move around in this landscape and visit the different locations. I'll show you some video of uh, this work. So here you see the, um, the the, the visitor is able to uh, operate the platform. You actually hold uh, an LCD screen by, on both sides. And by slightly rotating the screen, you rotate the, uh, you trigger the rotation of the platform. And, um, and also you have uh, buttons to control your forwards and backwards motion in the virtual world. So you put on glasses first, uh, polarizing glasses to, uh, to uh, register the, uh, the, um, the 3D image. You have an LCD screen in front of you, which again gives you a kind of map of the environment and uh, indicates your location in the environment. So here you see we are drifting through this virtual landscape amongst these uh, cylinders. And any one of these cylinders, you can just sort of go through the wall, enter the cylinder. And once you are inside this, that cylinder, you are basically at the center of a 3D panoramic photograph that was taken at one or other location uh, in, uh, in Humpy. The ground plan is a little metaphoric because uh, it, uh, Humpy is, uh, in the Ramayana, Humpy is considered to be uh, the home of um, Hanuman, the uh, monkey god. Uh, so we use, let's say, Hanuman's body as a map uh, to distribute uh, these cylinders. In some of these uh, uh, photographic environments, we also embedded uh, some 3D animations of uh, Hindu gods. Uh, here is uh, Shiva um, performing a, a traditional dance. Um, 
In this case, we actually filmed a dancer, an uh, Indian dancer here in Sydney, um, and then that data was sent to the animation lab. The animation lab created this figure of Shiva and then that embedded that in the uh, 3D uh, photograph. Um, it may interest you that this project also was the topic of uh, a, uh, a PhD uh, thesis uh, by a student uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Melbourne, and uh, she did a very uh, thorough study of, uh, let's say, of, of evaluation of audience behavior in this environment, and also it involved asking uh, visitors certain questions, which we found, let's say, interesting. And one of the questions was, where on your body did you experience this work? And uh, we offered a little diagram of a human figure and people could just draw on this. And here are some of the more interesting examples of responses from different people. You see those six examples. And that picture uh, on the right is the composite of all responses, okay? And this uh, we found interesting because, of course, there's a big concentration of, of, uh, of experience around the eyes and around the hands, but you see also there's evidence of people sort of uh, experiencing the work um, on other parts of their body. And you may find this uh, interesting. It's, it's just coincidental, but uh, uh, actually... Uh, this work was recently purchased, and this museum has been built around this work uh, in Bellary, not far from Humpy. And uh, it will be, uh, because this work was uh, uh, partnered with uh, Museum Victoria and also had uh, ARC research funding uh, as uh, contributing to its, uh, its creation, um, this museum will be open next week uh, by Minister Simon Crean in the context of the Ozfest. Um, again, in terms of this notion of, of documentation of cultural heritage and intangible cultural heritage, uh, this is an example of panoramic um, cinematography. Here we are filming uh, dervish dancers who are dancing around a camera and again, this, can, this is then experienced as a, uh, as a, as a panoramic uh, represent, representation. And here are some other examples. Um, this is work done at the ZKM in Karlsruhe, uh, which involves uh, rendering basically Google Earth into a, uh, into a cylindrical space, into a cylindrical projection environment. And also this connects online to a database called the, the World Wide Panorama. People post their panoramic pictures on this, uh, on this website. And you can just move around Google Earth and click uh, these different locations and just instantly bring up these panoramic photographs uh, that were um, um, sort of uh, crowdsourced uh, in, to, in, the, in the work. And also uh, one, let's say, uh, outcome of this research, which was largely done uh, at, um, at the iCinema Centre at UNSW, this 360-degree uh, panoramic uh, projection environment, were some um, um, outputs in, in relation to the mining industry. We worked with the um, the School of Mining Engineering at UNSW and developed applications for uh, mining, mining safety training. And a number of these systems have been sold and are in daily use uh, at mining training centres in, uh, in New South Wales. Um, another thematic is uh, the way in which these uh, types of um, this type of research uh, empowers the viewer to, in effect, become the camera person and the director and the editor of the content that is being um, presented. And uh, I'll show you again some experiments with different types of visualization environment, which uh, um, enable this um, um, experience. This is a, a dome projection environment um, 
where um, the, the, the viewer wears a uh, tracking device on their head. So the system basically can track where the viewer is looking. And uh, you see the projector is mounted on a um, pan and tilt device. So basically the, 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 the projected uh, image window follows the direction that you are looking. So again, you create a virtual environment that uh, encompasses the whole space. Um, and you, you basically control a window that looks into that virtual environment. So as I said, in effect, here in this work, you, uh, you become the camera person and the editor of the, uh, of the experience. Now, this is a particular artwork made by uh, French artist Jean-Michel Bruyère for this uh, system. And you can see how it, uh, uh, how it functions. He actually created what is a, a, a fisheye movie. It's a, a, um, a, a film which is a uh, 4,000 by 4,000 pixel movie. This is actually the fisheye movie uh, that's stored in the computer. And you are windowing around inside this, this uh, fisheye movie. One interesting aspect of this kind of cinematic experience is that it never repeats itself. I mean, every, every, every viewer basically choreographs the piece in a, in a personal and idiosyncratic way. So you're watching a, a unique performance of the work every time uh, you look at it. Um, this is uh, another work in this, um, in this uh, trajectory. Uh, this is done with uh, a theatre company in New York called the Wooster Group. Uh, we built, uh, this is a camera we built at the I Cinema Center in, uh, at UNSW, which is uh, a cluster of 12 um, video cameras able to record a quite high resolution um, panoramic image. And you can see it's placed in the middle of a table and uh, actors basically created a, th a piece of theater around uh, the camera. Uh, this is an unedited uh, half hour long performance in front of this 360 degree um, array of cameras. What do you see? You never know what is outside the frame. And the way it was presented was that uh, there, it was in a cylindrical projection environment. There are a number of rotating chairs, but there's one chair in the middle that controls a window which is in focus, and the rest of the image is out of focus. So it expresses the notion of, let's say, the window of sight in front of you and peripheral vision around you. And uh, by rotating the chair, you actually rotate this, this uh, in-focus uh, area. Um, and in doing so, also, you modulate, modulate the soundtrack. So you could say it's a 360-degree uh, environment where multiple narratives are being developed in all directions by the actors. But as you move around, you basically focus uh, things which interest you. And, at that, and you also focus the, uh, the soundtrack so that you're listening to that, those particular people. Um, uh, and you're also cutting between them. So again, as viewer, you are the editor and the camera person uh, in relation to the work. And also, you are uh, constituting a unique performance of the work. Um, another configuration for this kind of, um, let's say, um, viewer uh, control of uh, panoramic uh, experience is this uh, hemispherical uh, projection uh, system where you can basically rotate your point of view uh, in the uh, movie. And here, for instance, we did something. Uh, this was uh, also uh, recorded in Istanbul. At this, uh, uh, this is the Istanbul Symphony Orchestra, and the camera is actually placed between the, um, the conductor and the orchestra. So you can rotate your point of view to look at and watch the conductor as he's conducting the performance, or you can rotate around to the other side and watch the, um, watch the, uh, the musicians. 
And I'm showing this just uh, to, put, to indicate that these kinds of experiences also are very powerful tools for scientific visualization. This is work being done by Paul Burke at, uh, at University of Western Australia. Um, another important uh, thematic is, this, is the issue of database aesthetics. Um, and um, there are some interesting, let's say, um, historical trajectories. This, for instance, is a work by a French poet, Raymond Queneau. Uh, he made a famous work called The 100 Million Million Poems, um, which is basically taking a book uh, and, putting, and cutting every page under every line so that you could recombine every line uh, to constitute 100 million million poems. Um, in research done at, uh, at the I Cinema Center, this system was developed, the, uh, um, the, this 360 degree stereoscopic projection environment, and also this particular work, which was uh, an ARC uh, discovery uh, project. Um, it enables you basically to distribute um, thousands of, uh, or to contain thousands of video clips in a database and distribute uh, up to 500 video clips simultaneously in a 360 degree space around you. Um, a sort of antecedent for this kind of project can be found in uh, A.B. Warburg's Nenosin, uh, it, which is a visual cultural atlas, a means of studying the internal dynamics of imagery at the level of its medium rather than its content, performing image analysis through montage and recombination. But in the TVIS context, this, uh, this, this power to distribute um, uh, visual data suddenly takes on a new dimension because we can distribute this data in 360 degrees and in 3D in, in space. So this is the, uh, the, the, the way the piece works. Um, every clip has metadata attached to it. Uh, when you uh, basically click on any clip, it will go into the database, it will look for other clips which it... It will look for other clips. Uh, Jared, where Jared is here, isn't he? Look, Jared, you can see yourself. <laughs> uh, operating the system, great. Jared was one of the, uh, the co-developers of, uh, of this project. Um, the database, again, has thousands of, of uh, video clips. Uh, it looks at the metadata. Uh, it brings up what it thinks are similar clips in proximity to the one you've chosen. But interestingly enough, because you have a 360 degree space to present these images, it also puts the opposite behind you. So it basically, you could say, brings up the synonyms and the antonyms simultaneously. And you have this spectrum of, you know, this is what I asked for, and this is the opposite of what I asked for behind you. Um, he, it's, these, they are manually tagged, uh, these clips, because we were looking for certain, let's say, semantic um, uh, strategies. Um, you can also uh, drag and drop clips and, and assemble uh, sequences of clips. Um, there's some other interesting functions. You can also steer the search algorithm. You can say, well, I'm more interested in the color, or I'm more interested in the situation, or I'm more interested in the emotion. And then when it does the search, it, it'll focus those, uh, it'll focus the search engine in those uh, directions. Um, this, again, may interest uh, some of you. This is, these are the, uh, the key words that we were using in, in the tagging. Um, again, so you can, you'll understand what we were looking for in terms of semantic relationships. So anger, fear, grief, joy, love, and then expressions affirming, negating, greeting, farewelling, looking, questioning, and then things like arriving, departing, lying, sitting, standing, walking, running. And um, this, um, we did some statistical analysis on, on, on after all the tags have been put in place. So here you see um, the number of shots tagged with certain keywords. 
And I should tell you that all the data that we were using was a random slice of data uh, taken from um, free-to-air television here in Australia. Um, so we were able to then look at the different uh, programs and see um, what uh, per hundred shots, right? How much anger or how much fear or how much grief there were in it was in were in the different programs. So the, here you see this uh, graph that expresses this. And also we were able to compare the channels and see uh, what uh, proportions of love, joy, grief, fear and anger were being presented over a 24 hour period on each channel. Uh, and of course I mean, it's obviously interesting in the sense that there's this uh, quite a symmetry here in terms of what the proportions are. Enormous percentage of anger and uh, fear and grief, small proportions of love and joy. But indeed, it's interesting to notice that SBS and ABC offer you a little more um, love and joy. <laughs> <laughs> and here's, for instance, a, a break. This is the uh, the tagging of just uh, one seek one thing. Uh, a desperate housewives, right? It tells you a lot, doesn't it? Um, this is a peculiar graph because we had, a, we had f uh, I think, what, what was it, Jared? Four different people or three people doing the tagging. And here we actually could analyze the profile of each of the taggers because it was a bit subjective. You know, people look at the video and say, what's in the video? And here we could actually notice that each tagger had their own profile because you see on the graph that each tagger has a certain, it, it just looks different the way they did their tagging to the way others, the, the way others did their tagging. Now this is another work done in this particular environment, this AV environment, again done by this French artist Jean-Michel Bruyere. It's again based on a, a massive database of video clips, but his, let's say, aesthetic strategy of presenting these video, video clips is quite different because it becomes a kind of roller coaster ride uh, through uh, the history of all his uh, video production. And this in 3D, I assure you, is a very um, intense experience. Okay, I'm just going to go on to a next section. Viviani, how am I doing for time? I forgot to click on the uh, countdown. Am I halfway? Okay, then I'll... Um, um, other aspects which are interesting are to do with the kinesthetic experience, in other words, um, embodying big data, uh, future cinema also means addressing not just the eyes and ears, but also um, the whole body, smell, um, taste perhaps. Um, this is one uh, work made using a motion platform. Um, it's a very simple work. Uh, it allows you to drift through a virtual forest in all directions. You could, it's a, an infinite forest that extends up, down, left, right, forwards, backwards. So you're just basically navigating through a, 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 a never-ending forest. But you're on this platform, and the platform, of course, gives uh, motion cues uh, as, you are, as you are changing direction or as you're moving down or up. Very subtle but uh, it gives you this, the real, really gives you the, the sense. It actually gives information to your body, actually gives information to the balance mechanism in your ears so that you have a very strong uh, kinesthetic sensation of, of actually drifting through the forest. And of course, uh, this kind of application, this developed again by Paul Burke at UWA where you actually have a, uh, a um, uh, exercise machine in front of the um, of the screen. Uh, scalability is a, a, a very interesting topic, especially you'll notice that a lot of the work we're doing is very 
it's very large scale, um, is uh, high resolution, but uh, with this same data you can scale it right down, for instance, to this uh, uh, iPod version of what was a much, much larger uh, work originally. Augmented reality is a very strong uh, thematic and it's very current. It's, uh, uh, um, there are the resources for actually doing uh, effective augmented reality are uh, becoming more and more ubiquitous and, uh, and um, effective. Um, this is an early example that was done uh, for a museum in Paris, La Villette. Uh, it's a kind of a periscope and looking through this periscope, you actually look into the real space of the museum, but you see um, video data which is, uh, let's say, virtually superimposed. And this, this video data appears to float out in the museum like a ghost. Um, at a, at a distance of about 10 meters from where, where you're standing. So you create this kind of uh, overlay of, uh, of the, uh, um, of the uh, media uh, data and the real, the real space. And this is another example of this kind of conjunction of real and virtual space. You see a pedestal, uh, you can pick up a monitor, uh, and as you move the monitor around the pedestal, in front of the pedestal, you actually are looking at a golden calf, which is a virtual golden calf, standing on the pedestal. And as you move the monitor around, you can look at this golden calf from different points of view. And uh, a very recent, uh, div uh, let's say, um, development of this particular technique uh, is uh, being done now at City U. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work with the Dunhuang Academy, which is the uh, people who look after the Dunhuang Caves, uh, an extraordinary uh, collection of caves in the north of China, in the Gobi Desert. Um, and um, we've been looking at different strategies of visualization of these caves. Uh, here you see a, a booth actually in an art fair. Um, on the walls you see a wireframe drawing uh, which is the actual laser scan of, of one particular cave. Um, but you see people are handling uh, iPads. Um, and I'll show you a video of this. So as you move the iPad around, you're actually uh, windowing onto the, um, onto the uh, painting, the paintings in the cave. And uh, it's a one-to-one -one, uh, scale experience. So as you move towards the wall, you move towards the surface of the painting. Two iPads, each with their own, of course, point of view. And here you can see this, what I, what I said about this one-to-one. -one. If you bring the iPad right up to the surface of the, of the wall of the booth, you're literally against, against the surface of the painting, and you're seeing the painting one-to-one -one scale. So as you move the iPad over the surface of the wall, you are actually exploring that painting at that scale. You can also look up to the ceiling and see the painting on the paintings on the ceiling. <laughs> this is strange. I mean, I, I, this is one of the uh, phenomena of our time. Usually, there are people behind the person who's handling the iPad. So there's a whole lineup of cameras taking photographs or videoing, and even sometimes you have people videoing or photographing with their own iPad, right? And uh, it's 
You see, this person is actually presenting the image to the, uh, the photographers. So in terms of a virtual tourism, it's a very, it's a somewhat paradoxical uh, situation, of course. This is a work done at, uh, at Melbourne Museum. Um, it's it's uh, currently uh, set up there. It's a recent, uh, recently uh, built exhibition called The Wild. You see the whole room is just filled with these um, stuffed uh, creatures. And there are these um, sort of uh, devices which you can rotate and uh, tilt, um, which allow you to uh, basically uh, view the different uh, uh, animals, click on them, and then get information about them, uh, look at, um, at sort of uh, uh, ro um, rotation movies of each creature, actually see and see the, the, uh, these animals also in their own uh, habitat. Um, You see behind the screen there's a video camera. So the camera is actually looking around at the real space so that in effect you're actually clicking on the, on the animal in the real space and then getting information about that, uh, that, that creature. Uh, another important thematic is mixed reality, which is a sort of a, a, let's say extension or, of virtual reality where the, the you know, real and virtual spaces are kind of uh, intertwined. Um, this is an artwork that was uh, developed in, a, in this system. The system is called Reactor. Uh, it's a six-sided uh, back projection, you could say room, that you can walk around and so that you can have a virtual scene inside that room. Uh, this is a work based on a text of uh, Samuel Beckett, The Lost Ones, um, and he describes a community of uh, people who are sort of uh, incarcerated in a, a space, and so we created this a, a community of uh, virtual uh, characters. Um, and uh, there are also virtual torch beams that you can, con that you can steer uh, to illuminate the, uh, the interior of this room. So six people from six different points of view shine virtual torch beams into this uh, virtual space and uh, can then see or examine this community of uh, virtual characters and their behavior and uh, their appearance is determined, let's say, by the script uh, set up by, by Samuel Beckett, which is then translated via a game engine. So it's a game engine that basically embodies uh, that script. This is the torch that uh, controls the movement of the virtual torch beam. And the mixed reality component that is quite strong here is that you can shine this virtual torch beam through the room and illuminate the real person who's standing on the other side. And that's, you can see that here, that this person, by moving the torch, actually illuminates the operator on the other side. In this case, I'm standing on the opposite side. So you're creating a, a very paradoxical conjunction of, uh, of virtual and real uh, spaces. Again, the torch, virtual light beam going through the virtual environment and then seemingly illuminating the real person in real time who's standing on the opposite, opposite you. This is the, <clears throat> the structure of the game engine, the way that the, the way the uh, let's say the narrative behavior of the characters is organized. Is organized. They, 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 certain behaviors were motion captured, you know, so standing, walking, sitting, uh, different behavior modules, and then these behavior modules are sort of uh, controlled by the ga game engine a certain, according to certain rules. So actually, the the as a piece of theatre, it's continuously being improvised. So, in the last part of this presentation, I'll just focus on those uh, digital humanities and cultural heritage um, uh, researches that are currently going on at, um, at the Alive Lab at CityU. Um, 
One project involves uh, the, uh, the Han tombs in, uh, in China. There's a lot of, of course, um, a massive amount of, uh, of uh, construction going on in China at the, at the moment over the last years. And so they keep, you know, as they dig, they discover uh, these, uh, these tombs and um, they're then open to archaeologists for a certain period of time to document uh, with laser scanners and with uh, photo cameras before they are destroyed. I mean, only the really precious ones are kept. Um, but also, um, as soon as these tombs are open, they, they almost instantly, in, instantaneously begin to, to uh, degenerate. So, uh, very difficult to keep. So, it's really, it's really in this case, documenting the cave, which, uh, which uh, maintains its, um, its long-term um, sort of uh, existence. So this is an application we developed, again, using the 360 degree projection environment. You can click on, uh, on, on a, a tomb, go inside the tomb, um, zoom in on, on details, uh, look, at, look at the paintings on, on the walls, and, uh, and also uh, this, this particular application expl explicates those red dots show a narrative progression. So it basically explains to you the, um, the icono iconography of the paintings in the, uh, in the tomb. Um, another uh, larger, much larger project we're currently engaged in is again with the, the um, Dunhuang, um, the um, caves at Dunhuang. Uh, this is truly an extraordinary site. It's, uh, about six, over 600 caves painted over a period of uh, longer than 1,000 years by Buddhist, uh, by Buddhist monks. Um, and we developed this particular application which indicates a way in which we'd like to see the project develop. Initial, in the first place you have what we call the cave browser where you can look at the whole escarpment of caves and you see examples of each of the, of uh, a number of caves and you can, it, in the long term, you'll be able to click on any one of these and then visit that cave. Currently, we've just developed a project with one particular cave. This is Cave 220. Um, it's, uh, this is the, the cave itself. Uh, this is the, um, the laser scan data of the cave. Laser scans and photography are done by people at the Dunhuang Academy. They're doing this in all the caves. And then here we see uh, the laser scan data and the photography joined together and then embedded inside our 360 degree projection environment. When you enter, uh, you first simulate the experience of uh, really visiting the cave, which means you just shine a torch around. But then you can switch on the house lights and look at the whole cave, which is something you, you cannot do if you, really vis if you are visiting the real cave. So you can experience the cave in its totality fully lit. And we have some very powerful tools uh, for looking at the uh, painting, for instance a virtual magnifying glass where you can zoom right in on very fine detail. This is because the, the, uh, the documentation of the cave is done in very, very high resolution. So they've got sort of gigapixel photographs of, of each of these paintings. So we can use this data so that you are able to just zoom in and look really at, at individual brush strokes. And we also did some experiments with uh, animation where we uh, sort of um, animate certain components in the, uh, in, the, um, in the painting. And also uh, working with academics at the uh, Dunhuang Academy looking at the way these paintings probably looked when they were first painting, looking at the original coloring of the paintings. Uh, also extracting out of the paintings 3D models of certain objects, like these are incense burners, which are painted. And here building actual models of these incense burners. So here you see um, this, the seven medicine Buddhas uh, in their, let's say, um, original coloring. 
or sort of conceived to be original colouring. Also, there are certain other elements in the painting that are interesting. There are two groups of musicians. Ten more minutes. Oh, that's fine. So we actually pull the instruments out of the group of musicians and model it as a 3D object so you can actually look at the instruments and hear the sound of these instruments. And uh, there are also dancers in this uh, particular painting. So we uh, filmed, uh, we worked with dancers from the uh, Beijing Dance Academy, and uh, we are filming them here uh, in 3D. This is the recording. And this is the dancers coming out of the painting. A very powerful tool also for academic uh, study. Um, I've been in, uh, with a number of people who really are studying the, uh, the, these paintings, have given lectures in this environment, and have just spent you know, hours just you know, moving the magnifying glass around, looking at details and talking about details, and also discovering things that, that, uh, that they weren't even previously aware of. We also did some evaluation. We, we had, and that we are doing evaluation on this work, uh, actually evaluating what different types of, uh, let's say, resources, what, what the uh, effect is in terms of uh, visitor experience. Um, um, recently, we've been working with uh, a massive database, the, uh, the Europeana, which is a pooling of, uh, of all the uh, cultural uh, resources of major museums in, in Europe. Um, and we've developed, uh, we developed a, um, an application called eCloud. Um, it was uh, premiered recently uh, in Brussels um, and also shown in another in Leuven. Um, and it links to a specific uh, archive. Uh, it's a crowdsourced uh, ar archive. Um, in relation to um, World War I. The database includes over 10,000 letters, postcards, photographs, and stories from Germany, Luxembourg, Ireland, Slovenia, and the UK, collected during roadshows uh, to various locations throughout these countries. Um, and of course, we're coming up to the 100-year the commemoration of uh, World War I in uh, 2014. So this is a sort of pilot project for how this particular database um, could be presented. Um, the curators uh, at Europeani selected key contributions to create stories of relationships and social meanings out of this database, um, which, uh, which then unfold through, through uh, the sort of uh, navigation of the metadata. Uh, eCloud uses the geolocation of the Europeana data set to position each of the key stories on representative satirical maps of Europe. The maps show opposing points of view across Europe during the war and provide a highly emotive context. This is a nine meter rear projected stereoscopic screen and using an iPad interface, uh, eCloud interactively transports the users through clouds of visual associations and keywords made possible through the metadata. And the data is assessed through the API.
Um, another extension of this immersive cultural data browser is for localized museum museological collections. Uh, and currently we're working with iCinema and Museum Victoria on a three-year uh, ARC um, uh, discovery project, um, which would be a browser that, that would actually present uh, uh, the bulk of the uh, Museum Victoria collection in this 360-degree uh, um, visualization environment. And this just uh, indicates some um, prototyping of how this, uh, this, this database could be uh, organized. Again, using an iPad interface uh, so that you can uh, basically um, manipulate uh, a, a very, very big body of, uh, of uh, audiovisual materials and very heterogeneous materials, of course, photography, video, uh, text, um, 3D models. Uh, interviews, uh, various uh, types of, uh, of data. Another project we're involved with is with a uh, uh, professor at uh, UC Berkeley who's uh, been working for a long time uh, in uh, Korea on the Tripitaka Koreana, which is the world's largest Buddhist canon. This is the way, this is the actual Buddhist canon as it looks in situ wood blocks with text carved onto these wooden blocks. Uh, what Professor Lou Lancaster has done is uh, he's taken uh, the digitized versions of these, uh, of these wood blocks and uh, he's converted all the characters into blue dots. And, uh, and then, of course, you end up just with, a, a, with say an abstract uh, representation of the total of the complete text. And then by identifying certain characters and changing their color, you can begin to, to find patterns uh, in, this, uh, in this space. But again, the, uh, the body of material is enormously big and then you become limited by how much you can just put onto a normal um, screen and, and how, to the extent to which you want to navigate this, this, uh, this, let's say, vast data space. So what we're proposing is that we take this uh, starting point of his and actually embed that into a full 360 degree immersive environment so you'd end up with a situation like this where that whole uh, um, Buddhist canon would then distribute itself uh, around the viewer and uh, you would be able to basically um, uh, travel through it and also um, create um, these uh, patterns of relationships in this kind of environment. Um, this pretty much concludes what, I, was, uh, what I've been happy to show you today. I'd like to just uh, bring your attention to a couple of things which may interest some of you. We, we are currently uh, um, finalizing this conference which will be presented uh, early in December in Hong Kong at CDU. It's called uh, Future Culture. And uh, we have a, a really a fantastic uh, lineup of, uh, of top speakers from around the world who will be addressing this topic. So this is an opportunity, uh, if you're interested in this particular area, to uh, um, learn more. And the other thing I'll point you to is this particular book uh, uh, written by um, one of uh, um, one of uh, my associates, also uh, someone. Uh, who did a lot of work, a lot of the work I've shown you that uh, derives from uh, work done at Museum Victoria is her work, this book, Theorizing Digital Cultural Heritage. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Pleasure. Remarkable presentation. It's amazing what you've done with an artwork and, and creating the, the virtual space and situations for people, everyday people. Um, and not only that, it's actually it's a, it's a remarkable way of uh, demonstrating applied use of technology. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. Please, let's uh, say thank you again to Jeffrey. <laughs> It's again, thank you too. And um, we are open to the forum for any questions. I'll see if I can find the.
there any questions? Hi, Jeffrey. Hi. Yes, yeah, there. Hi, Jeffrey. Um, you've taken us through the real, the virtual, art, science, technology, and you've got an incredible team that you work with. And I just wondered if you could talk a little about the expertise that's brought together as you're directing these projects. Sorry, ask the question again. Sorry. The, the range of expertise yeah. that you bring together in this, these projects, because there's an enormous level of expertise that you've demonstrated here, because there's artistic expertise, there's technological expertise, uh, there's an incredible packed in behind these projects that you do. And I just wondered if you could talk a little about the teams that actually work on these projects. Right. Oh, no, thank you for that question. It is indeed fundamental. I mean, um, first of all, of course, a key to so many of these projects is uh, a, a, a interdisciplinarity. Um, every one of these projects, uh, well, let's say the large majority, are done by teams of people. Um, coming from different backgrounds, um, and um, and certainly you have, in many cases, very competent uh, software engineers. Uh, there's also uh, the, the physical engineering of these uh, machineries, which is uh, is very important. Uh, people with different expertises, people coming out of the uh, out of the uh, sort of. Uh, E humanities, the, the the sort of especially the cultural heritage uh, sort of understanding, um, music, uh, composers, uh, visual artists, um, but certainly I think uh, one th uh, I would say that one thing that, that distinguishes a lot of this work is that it uh, I would say in the first place it's driven by a uh, let's say a um, an art practice right it comes out of an art practice. Right. So uh, at its very core, it's very much concerned with the kind, with let's say the kinds of experiences that art is all about, and also the quality of experience which art is all about. So that's really something I think which is uh, which is important, and uh, and it's also I think why it's appropriate that a lot of this research. Uh, took place in, in, in the context of institutions which were, uh, let's say, art-related. So the I Cinema Center in Sydney, for instance, is under the umbrella of both the College of Fine Arts and the, um, uh, the School of, uh, of um, um, uh, Computer uh, Engineering and uh, Computer Science. And, um, and also at, uh, at City U, it's... Uh, um, at least one of our uh, programs is uh, is uh, partnership with uh, computer science and uh, the School of Creative Media. So that conjunction uh, is uh, and that interdisciplinary conjunction is, I think, very fundamental to uh, to what you to what you're looking at. I think it couldn't have come about without that those uh, that, that that dynamic. Thank you. I enjoyed that very much. Um, a lot of it's uh, very abstract, but does a lot of it actually make it into the more conventional um, media and cinema and other kinds of experiences? So from this work, you mentioned one that actually got purchased. But is there a pathway where a lot of it sort of evolves out of this yeah. space yeah. into the conventional um, arena for cinema and so on? Um, I have to say that, that uh, almost every single work that, that, uh, that uh, I presented it is developed in relation to one or other real world context. Okay, so um, even though there's, there, there are, let's say, very strong, let's say, research uh, components, but they're, they're always driven by, uh, by a certain context. Um, and um, 
but though different works have different lifespans, yes, yeah? so some works might uh, be developed just in the context of a festival or an exhibition and uh, may not go further than that. I mean, even that piece that I told you about, which was um, recently, is now recently set up permanently in a museum in India. Originally, that was a commission for, a, um, for an exhibition in, Par in, uh, in France, in Lille. And it was only meant to be there for a month or two. Uh, and that was what, what the, the piece was made for that, for that event. Then it ended up at the Immigration Museum in, uh, in Melbourne and was shown there for about a year. It was very successful, very popular. And then, and then somehow or other, uh, people from India saw the work at the Immigration Museum and were busy building a cultural precinct. And they decided, well, this is exactly the work they wanted for that precinct. So by a pattern of, let's say, coincidences and accidents, this work which started off just as a one-off temporary piece has ended up being a permanent installation. Uh, we have a permanent installation at uh, Melbourne, Melbourne Museum, one of our 360-degree systems, and uh, others are currently uh, in discussion. So actually, I would say a lot of what we're doing is very pertinent, very current. Uh, one, of, uh, the, one of the organizations we're working with at the moment is the Nutch, Dutch National Television Archive. They've got tens of thousands, of, they've got the whole history of Dutch television digitized. And they're looking for a way to offer that to a general public as something that they can navigate and enjoy yeah, and, and sort of play with. So we're actually developing an application for them which will be permanently a permanent uh, installation there. So uh, even though I I in many respects here, yeah, there, it's very much, it's uh, very much the same. In a uh, somewhat uh, uh, innovative research territory, I think at the same time what we're doing is ex exceptionally current. And I would say everybody, uh, all organizations or all institutions that have big uh, um, bodies of, uh, of uh, audiovisual data uh, are, are looking for, for ways I mean, at first, of course, the internet was the original notion of how to distribute this information. But to have um, uh, uh, in situ these large immersive environments is, is another very powerful uh, resource. And the other thing that I would mention in this context is that the cultural heritage work we're doing also has another very uh, big significance. And that is that places like the Dunhuang Caves the, one of the big issues there is long-term sustainability of the caves themselves. And they are under enormous stress from tourism at the moment. And uh, they, they really are intending sooner, sooner rather than later to close these caves entirely or to open them in a very, very limited way. So they are looking for strategies to compensate for that by giving people uh, another, uh, another experience, a parallel experience, so that the str stress on the caves will be reduced. So, uh, and this is not just in, in China, but all over the world, I mean, like Lascaux and other places. So uh, these strategies are very, very relevant to the whole issue of sustainability in, the, in, the, in this field, in the area of cultural heritage. Thank you. Unfortunately, we ran out of time. Um, Jeffrey will be around a yeah, little bit certainly. longer, certainly. so you can ask more questions later. Yeah. And please join me in thanking Jeffrey for